After turning pro in the summer of 1996, Tiger Woods turned the golf world upside down. The 97 Masters loomed as the prodigy's ultimate examination, his first major championship as a pro, and a chance to justify the cresting hype. I knew what was coming. First time I played with Tiger, or the first time was before 97, I said that you'll never see another guy like this guy. It was ridiculous to play with him. Phenomenal short game. And there were guys that hit the ball as good as he did, as far as he did, but his imagination around the greens and his skill set around the greens was so high, and he just seemed to will putts in the hole. The composure he had on his face, like, nobody's gonna beat me. I'm gonna just run through that finishing line and win by X number of shots. He, he just was, kept going and going and going. Tiger, at 21, was skinny. Uh, he's six foot two and 155 pounds, doesn't look like much, and he's blowing the ball 50 yards past the best players in the game. He was hitting wedges and nine irons into the par fives on, on his second shot. I mean, it was just astonishing. As an 11-year-old, I wasn't following professional golf in general much, but you knew the name Tiger Woods. You know, there were other big names, obviously. Faldo was a defending champ, Norman, Montgomery, Fred Couples, Ben Crenshaw, all these guys that we remember from that era, but this was a different threshold of excitement over one guy that we hadn't seen before. But after nine holes of the first round, it looked like Tiger had been overwhelmed by the moment as he shot a jittery four over par 40. Of course, uh, wise uh, golf scribe that I am, I said, well, I guess we can discard him. And I went off to follow somebody else because I thought, it doesn't look like this is going to be Tiger's week. I think he had said later that he'd made a swing adjustment between the ninth green and the 10th tee. It would become a theme in Tiger's career is that he wanted to own his swing. He wanted to have this feeling that when he got in trouble, uh, that he could fix it. Stepping to the 10th tee, Woods fixed his swing in his head, just like that. He went on to birdies number 10, 12, and 13, and eagle 15. He flipped a switch and off he went. And then on 17, he rolled in a putt from maybe 15, 17 feet on a tricky green, and Faldo, the defending champ who he's playing with, is sort of on the fringe, and as the putt drops, uh, uh, Faldo just sort of dropped his head. But you got the sense that even Faldo is playing with a sense of resignation, like this is a different level of golf. Tiger shredded the back nine in a mere 30 strokes, finishing the round with a 200 par 70. 30, that's not many strokes to navigate that whole back nine. So it was a wild, exciting uh, first day. Woods continued his assault in the second round, firing a 66 that set up a Saturday showdown with Colin Montgomery, the blustery Scott who was trying to win his first major championship. Here's a seasoned pro, in many respects, was the best that Europe had to uh, offer. And uh, he came off that round practically staggering. Woods dropped a 65 on poor Monty, blowing him off the golf course by nine strokes. And then Saturday night when Colin uh, came in to talk about the round, Colin was brief and to the point, essentially saying, it's over, it's not humanly possible for this guy to lose the tournament. And that just sort of summed it up, and that summed up the feeling that a lot of people had watching it, that. They were playing against almost a robot. This was a machine against men, and it wasn't a fair fight. Woods held a commanding nine-stroke lead, but he was determined not to let up. I went to the toilet in the locker room, and I'm washing my face and my hands and everything, and out of the toilet comes over his tiger. And he, he walks by me, man, and, and I, I see him in the mirror, you know. This guy was just, like, lasered. And I'm like, I'm like, wash my hands, I'm getting out of here. And he ground his way around the course. He wasn't like holding back in any way. I mean, at that point, you were just watching to see by how many he was gonna win. Tiger smashed a number of records with his victory, going 18 under par and winning by a dozen strokes. I mean, four rounds at Augusta National without a three putt, that's absolutely unheard of. And I remember the fist pump, the fist pump on the 18th green, when he knows he broke the record. It's an incredible image for a lot of reasons, but I think emotionally that day, what Tiger did and, and what he represented to everyone, that's something no one will ever forget. The 1997 Masters was a watershed event. Woods' victory healed old wounds at Augusta National and established a cross-cultural icon who would transcend golf to become a dominant force in popular culture and the sports marketplace. 
It can't be overstated how much Tiger made golf cool. All of a sudden, everybody wanted to play golf. Everyone wanted to be Tiger Woods. There was a whole new market then for, for cool golf stuff. You had cool golf clothes, cool clubs, cool bags, and you could dress like Tiger. After having played his way into the history books, Tiger stepped off the 18th green and shared an instantly famous hug with his father, Earl. And I've thought for 20 years about what that hug really meant. I think part of that hug was we showed them. And now you've got this African-American kid winning the Masters Tournament, first black man to ever do it, at age 21. I had tremendous enthusiasm and optimism about what Tiger was going to mean for golf in this country. He immediately became the single most powerful force in golf, just broadening the appeal of the game and forever forgetting about its lily white background.